All right, we made it to the end of series six. In this episode, I'm going to talk about uh, cumulative sentences, uh, some sentence combining suggestions, and the power of uh, a well-placed short sentence. And just to warn you, I'm going to be doing that by making reference to a lot of the texts that I referred to previously in this series. They will all be linked down in the description. So when I bring one up, you can uh, click on it, go back and reread it, get a sense of the context and the feel and the tone of that piece, uh, and then you'll be ready to hear what I have to say about it. But for right now, theme song. Okay, a cumulative sentence. A cumulative sentence starts with a simple sentence, a single uh, introductory clause, uh, and then goes on to add prepositional phrases or other kinds of phrases or even subordinate clauses in order to add additional information to the sentence. Um, it's basically a sentence that lists uh, is a good way to think of it. Um, not every long sentence is cumulative, but cumulative sentences do tend to be long. Uh, so I want to warn you as we go into this discussion that if you were to put a whole bunch of cumulative sentences in a row in your writing, it's not going to sound great. In fact, the examples, and this is from the, uh, the story about digging the tunnels under Los Angeles for the subway, the examples I'm using here uh, from that text are not adjacent at all. They are not near enough to each other that it would sound really repetitive. But let's take a look at one of those. Tunnels are turning the earth into an ant farm with massive projects underway in London, New York, Hong Kong, and Germany. This is a cumulative sentence at its most basic. It starts with a very simple declarative uh, independent clause. Tunnels are turning the earth into an ant farm. And then we have this list that sort of accumulates the places where this ant farm is being developed. This, as I said, the, the single best, easiest way to write a cumulative sentence. Now let's look at another one from that text. Veterans of other tunnels, they have built passages for water to flow through the San Bernardino Mountains and under Lake Mead, and they look ahead to the possibility of digging beneath the streets of South Pasadena or in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Uh, so this is a little bit more textured of a cumulative sentence, whereas that first example, simple independent clause, list of places. This one uh, creates its list with some more complicated phrases, and in fact, there's a whole second clause that introduces another new list of cumulative phrases. So uh, the, the cumulative sentence not only is a great way to get a lot of information, but it's also a flexible enough tool that you can kind of combine two cumulative sentences together and still have something that is uh, both grammatical, well-written, and easy to understand. One good way to get a cumulative sentence is to look in your text for short sentences in a row and think about combining them. Uh, for an example of a cumulative sentence that we can see is kind of put together this way, I'm going to go back to that uh, essay called And Yet You Try, which is about the kid who died of brain cancer and his father and all that. It was the sad one. Uh, but here's a sentence from that text. Mylan's father, Sanjeev Gambir, MD, PhD, who goes by the name Sam, is also a physician, an expert in diagnostic imaging who chairs the Stanford Department of Radiology, and also directs Stanford's molecular imaging program. So this is introducing one of our main characters and it, it wants to go through there his qualifications, his bona fides, who he is that makes him important to this story. And you can see how that cumulative sentence that we have there could easily be broken up into a bunch of smaller sentences. It might look like this. Sanjeev Gambir, MD, PhD, is Mylan's father. Gambier goes by the name Sam. He is also a physician. He is also an expert in diagnostic imaging. He chairs the Stanford Department of Radiology. He also directs Stanford's molecular imaging program. Now that's seven short sentences that writer Julie Gracious could have put together, but as you could tell when I was reading it, it sounds really childish, right? If you were reading that, you'd be like, 
Was this a book report by a fourth grader? Um, so if you find yourself in a situation where you have a lot of those short descriptive sentences about the same thing in a row, do what she did. Pick one short declarative sentence. Mylan's father was also a physician. And then go cumulative. Use phrases or maybe some subordinate clauses, because she's got those in there too, in order to add on what it is that you are trying to say. The cumulative sentence can be powerful and effective when used well, and it is so much better than a bunch of short declarative sentences strung together in a row. Let me throw you just one more example of a cumulative sentence from one of the texts from earlier in the series. Uh, this is from the article One More Time by uh, writer Elizabeth Helmuth Margulies uh, about uh, repetition in music. Then again, classical rondos provide very little opportunity for audience participation. And it's notable that musical situations that expressly call for broad involvement generally feature even more repetition. Think of the number of times a church responsorial calls on the congregation to sing a single phrase back. Now, uh, what Margulies has done here, she's actually taken a compound sentence and she's gone cumulative on the back half of that compound sentence. She could have turned it all into a series of very short sentences, which would have sounded, again, kind of childish like this. Then again, classical rondos provide very little opportunity for audience participation. Some musical situations are notable. The music situations expressly call for broad involvement. They also generally feature even more repetition. One example is the number of times a church responsorial calls on the congregation to sing a single phrase back. Now that's five sentences, and uh, you know the first one and the last one are kind of long and the ones in the middle are a bit shorter, but it's still a lot clunkier and a lot, I think, less clear in terms of what Margulies was trying to get across. So again, when used at just the right moment in your writing, a cumulative sentence can make a huge difference. Finally, short sentences, and especially the power of a well-placed short sentence. Um, everything in this episode, and, and really this whole series about sentences and syntax, has been about making your sentences longer. And there's a very good reason for that. Young writers, unskilled writers, nervous writers, at the beginnings of their careers, they may not feel confident about stringing together a long sentence, a compound complex sentence that can go on for a while, or a, a, a cumulative sentence that may feel like it doesn't end, or a loose sentence that kind of almost wants to spiral out of control but doesn't. And so I get a lot of essays that are short sentence, short sentence, short sentence, short sentence, short, and I don't like that. But I also then get a lot of essays that are long sentences, long sentences, long sentences. That's just as boring. So what you want to be able to do as a writer is mix up what you are doing. And in particular, when you do long sentence, long sentence, long sentence, short sentence, it has a powerful effect. If you think of uh, the way boxers use combinations, you know, jab, jab, hook, um, that's kind of what a well-placed short sentence at or near the end of a paragraph that has longer sentences can do for you. Uh, now, back in the episode on parallelism, I talked about setting a pattern and sticking to it. This is not breaking that pattern. It's not about breaking parallel, but it is instead about finding a way to deliver the jab or the hook, whichever one uh, works best for that metaphor. Again, I am not really into the sportses. So I'm, I'm giving a lot of credit, really all the credit, uh, to a guy named Roy Peter Clark, who published an essay in the New York Times, also linked below, called uh, The Short Sentence as Gospel Truth. And what Clark says is something profound. Express your most powerful thought in the shortest sentence. And I think that means two things. Number one, Clark is telling you that you don't want your claim, your most important point, to be lost on your readers. You don't want to bury it inside of a much longer piece of text. But the second thing he's saying is uh, what I'm really trying to get at with this last section of this last episode, which is that a piece of punctuation, not a period, not an exclamation point, but a two or three or four word sentence 
as a piece of punctuation at the end of a paragraph, especially at the end of an introduction, can be a powerful, powerful thing. I'm going to turn it over to Clark for a second. A long sequence of short sentences slows the reader down, each period acting as a stop sign. That slow pace can bring clarity, create suspense, or magnify emotion, but can soon become tedious. It turns out that the short sentence gains its power from its proximity to longer sentences. So what, I've, what I was saying earlier, a whole bunch of short sentences in a row that sounds childish or sounds boring, that's really true. Clark is agreeing. And what he's saying is that if you want to use the short sentence, you've got to give it something to contrast against. And yes, we have seen some great examples of the short sentence in action in some of the texts from earlier in this series. I'm going to go to uh, Laugh Kookaburra by David Sedaris that I talked about, I think, way back in episode one. Uh, I'm going to read this for you, uh, but I'm going to warn you, there's the verb shout, which doesn't mean what we think it means. Shout is an Australian, I mean, Australians are weird, right? It's, uh, shout is an Australian word for uh, I'm buying this for you and shut up about it. Okay, so uh, here's, this, here's the paragraph. We kept in touch after her visit and when my work was done and I was given a day and a half to spend as I liked, Pat offered herself as a guide. On that first afternoon, she showed us around Melbourne and shouted coffee. The following morning, she picked us up at our hotel and drove us into what she called the bush. I expected a wasteland of dust and human bones, but it was nothing like that. When Australians say the bush, they mean the woods, the forest. So what Sedaris is doing there is he's got these fairly long sentences and he ends with this two word sentence, the forest. I know you're thinking that's a fragment, it's not a real sentence. Doesn't matter, shut up. It makes perfect sense in context, which is what a sentence is. Um, and, and what I really like is that he's contrasting his image of Australia as an American, right? Which is basically uh, the, uh, those Mel Gibson movies, what, The Road Warrior, right? Um, that's uh, uh, Mad Max, that's what I'm going for. You know, that's what we think of, it's desert. It's a bunch of apocalyptic guys driving around in cars and fighting each other in a thunderdome. But that's not what the bush is at all. It's a forest and, and so putting the forest as a little uh, piece of verbal punctuation at the end of the paragraph, Sedaris is letting us know that it actually isn't what we Americans think it is. Um, we, we also talked about, uh, back in episode one, an essay by Roxane Gay called The Price of Black Ambition. Let me read you a paragraph from that. The concept of a big break often implies that once you've achieved a certain milestone, everything falls into place. Life orders itself according to your whims. There is no more struggle. There is nothing left to want. There is no more rejection. This is a lovely, lovely fantasy bearing no resemblance to reality. And yet, I have noticed that my emails to certain key people in my professional life are answered with astonishing speed where they were once answered at a sedate and leisurely pace. I enjoy that. And, and Roxanne Gay does something with the short sentence that's kind of amazing. She not only has, I enjoy that at the end, you know, a nice little piece of, Mwah, I have gotten a break in a way. Um, she does it in the middle where she says, okay, in reality, you do still have to work hard even if you've gotten a break. But she wants us to pause. She wants us to consider because she's saying, let me tell you though, there is this thing. And there you have it. We made it to the end of this series on sentences, okay? These last three pieces of advice. Use cumulative sentences when it's appropriate. And you do that by combining a, you know, a series of short, boring sentences together. And finally, don't abandon the short sentence altogether. Put an important or your most important idea in your shortest sentence. Use that short two or three or four word sentence as a real piece of punctuation uh, that gets its power from its proximity to the longer sentences around it, as Clark says. So thank you for sticking all the way to the end of episode seven of this series. I do appreciate it. There will be another series to come. Series eight is on diction, which is a word choice. So we go from sentences to individual words. It's going to be a good time, okay? I will see you for the next one.
Milan's father, Sanjeev Gambir, MD, PhD, who goes by the name Sam, is also a physician, an expert in diagnostic imaging who chairs the Stanford Department of Radiology and also directs Stanford... Stanford's. <laughs> 